We're diving into a topic that we've maybe dealt with since we were kids, sometimes on a playground, sometimes at school, on the school bus, at the bus stop, but hey, it doesn't stop there. You know, you thought you were going to leave it behind, but no, here we are in the grown-up world and we're still dealing with it. And in this video, we're going to talk about how we still deal with it at work, in the workplace. I'm so happy that I don't have to deal with this now because I own my own company, but you know, it still happens. You know, sometimes I see it when I'm dealing with people in contract negotiations or tangentially, at least I don't have to deal with it within my own company, but I still see it. I still feel the effects of it sometimes, but at least now I know authentically who I am but it doesn't make it any more fun. So the first one that often happens is, you know, that whole sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never hurt me. But that's not true. Names hurt you over and over and over again. And so that very first one is verbal bullying. Verbal bullying is where, you know, what do you think? That person uses those names, that harsh language, those insults, that ridicule, demeaning language to belittle you, to intimidate you, to come after you. They might write out, call you stupid or whatever, but they might just try to cut you down in some way. Their goal is to undermine you, to undermine your confidence. And it could be your boss. It could be a coworker. It could be a colleague. It could be even somebody underneath you, you know, as far as a subordinate, but it still doesn't make it any less hurtful. You know, even if it's a subordinate to you, it doesn't make it any less hurtful, right? Impact of verbal bullying can be long lasting and it can lead to decreased productivity. It can lead to increased stress levels, certainly damage your self-esteem. And, you know, this is a person who's constantly criticizing people. Somebody who says, you know, I don't like your idea. They're constantly shooting out, shooting down other people's ideas or contributions during meetings. It, It can be somebody who uses derogatory language or insults, you know, maybe while they're working. It could be somebody who publicly humiliates the target, like right out, maybe while you're having lunch or during a meeting or during a call. Sarcastic comments are the same thing. Something that's disguised as a joke that's the same thing. Uh, oh, don't don't give it to so and so. He'll never get it done on time. You know, that's a, a sarcastic comment that can also be hurtful. You know, engaging in name calling, that can also be hurtful. Offensive language can can be something that other coworkers don't necessarily like too. Shouting to assert your authority, yelling at somebody. I've seen people say, this is the worst piece of crap I've ever seen. What the hell is this? Did you think that you were actually going to accomplish something by doing this? You know, something like that. That's verbal bullying. Instilling fear in somebody. Get this done or your job is on the line. You know, that is verbal bullying as well. It's not fun if you're dealing with somebody like that. I do have phrases for disarming narcissists that you are certainly uh, welcome to, to grab. I would definitely highly encourage you that you get them. You, they're free. Go to disarmthenarc.com to get them, disarmthenarc.com and use them to help you to disarm people who are you're dealing with like this so that you can interact with them hopefully in a more positive way and make it better for yourself. The next one is the passive aggressive bully. Personally, I cannot stand dealing with these people. These are more of your covert narcissistic type of people. They're more subtle in their approach, but honestly, I think that they're equally as damaging and damning in dealing with them because they're more of like what I call the clean hands. You know, they try to keep their hands clean when you're interacting with them, but it's more like things under the radar so that they don't like things don't get back to them, right? They, they might spread rumors. They might have backhanded compliments. 
oh yeah, you know, you're really good at that, you know, when, when you get to it, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing, like very passive aggressive, right? I mean, I'm really smart, but you know, you certainly work really hard. Just like a backhanded compliment like that, sabotaging other people's work, making sure you don't get things done on time, not getting you something that you needed to have on, to make sure that you got something done on time. Actions create a toxic work environment where trust is eroded and relationships can become extremely strained. You know, again, this is where remarks can be, you know, very snide, something under a breath, deliberately withholding important information, an email inadvertently didn't get sent. Oh, I thought I sent that. Here it was. It was in my outbox. You know, I thought it was sent. Oh, I, I don't know how that happened. Re resources didn't make it when they were supposed to. Covert narcissists, they often couch their rumors in the form of care. Just condescending, backhanded compliments to make others feel inadequate. If you're dealing with somebody, somebody like that, you know, you're certainly going to need support. I have a, a free private Facebook group that I highly recommend that you join, Narcissist Negotiators with Rebecca Zung. A lot of activity going on in there with people supporting each other. Definitely join that and get therapy if you need therapy. If you don't have access to good therapy, we have a sponsor here on this channel, which is BetterHelp. And you can go to betterhelp.com forward slash Rebecca Zung for online therapy. It is a sponsor here. So if you sign up, we um, receive commissions. It doesn't cost you any extra. We just want you to have access to good resources. There is a good video, which is 10 power packed phrases to unmask a covert narcissist instantly. And I definitely recommend that you check that out also. The next type of bully is the manipulative bully, more of a covert narcissistic type of bully. This individual employs manipulation and cunning tactics to gain power and control over their targets. So this is a person who uses like gaslighting techniques or manipulation, like they manipulate facts to confuse or undermine their victims. So they manipulate situations to, to get people to be pit people against each other. They, they want to create a hostile work environment. They want to create a work environment where they set themselves up to look like the good one and everybody else is the bad one. So they might say, oh, so-and-so is a problem or this one's a problem. And they, they make it seem like everybody else is maybe talking about each other. So they get people to be mad at each other, but they're the good ones. Or they might take credit for somebody else's work to the boss and they don't give proper recognition to have whoever should have gotten recognition. They just use manipulative tactics to create conflicts. They engage in gaslighting to distort facts, to make targets question their own sanity. They threaten or jeopardize other people's job security and advancement opportunities. They fake kindness or empathy just to manipulate into uh, other people into doing things for them. They're just, you know, not good people in general. So that is the third kind of bully. The fourth kind of bully, the last kind of bully that we're going to take a look at for this particular video is what we call the cyber bully, of course, in this day and age. We're going to look at cyber bullying, right? So this is a, di you know, the digital kind of bully, the bully who sits behind their computer, hides behind that screen and uses online platforms to harass people, to intimidate people, to threaten their victims and um, engages in online humiliation, spreading false information, trying to intimidate people in a way that, you know, they can remain anonymous. Of course, it attacks 
a person's well-being. It attacks their core and significantly impairs their ability to work. And, and this is a person who sends harassing messages, threatening emails to their colleagues. It could be even sexual, things of a sexual nature in this particular instance, derogatory messages. It could be somebody who posts insulting comments on social media about their coworkers, spreads false information about their coworkers. And of course they do all of this in a an anonymous fashion. And so they can stalk them. And, and this person ends up feeling very afraid, very afraid for themselves, afraid for their life, afraid for their safety sometimes. Probably the scariest form of, of bully. And they absolutely need to be shut down. So I want you to put that in the comments right now. Shut them down. Shut them down. So those are the four types of workplace bullies that I'm going to talk about in this particular video. Eight shocking signs that you are the victim of a hidden workplace bully. And you won't believe number six. So make sure that you stay all the way till the end as well. Shedding light on this critical topic, workplace bullying. Remember that you're not alone. This goes on probably in almost every workplace. So let's dive into eight telltale signs that you are a target of workplace bullying abuse. Number one is constant criticism. Constant criticism. Workplace bullies often resort to unfair and unwarranted criticism directed at their targets. So if you find yourself continuously receiving negative feedback for tasks that you've performed, that you know you've done a good job on, you know you've performed well, you know you've done everything that you were supposed to do, or you've even maybe go, gone above and beyond things that you were supposed to do, or the criticism that you're receiving is, really disproportionate to the situation. It really could be a red flag. Remember, constructive feedback is one thing. That's essential for growth. But targeted and excessive criticism could be a sign of potential bullying. So here's an example. You've completed a project that received positive feedback from your team, but your supervisor is consistently finding minor faults and undermines your achievements during performance reviews. That could be a red flag. Or your coworker repeatedly points out insignificant errors in your reports, even though they're well within acceptable standards, making you feel like you could never do anything right. Those are two examples of constant criticism. Second one is exclusion and isolation. This is something that you'll often see with covert narcissists. This is one where they, they, you know, especially with covert narcissists, they play the part of being the wonderful one, the kind one, but then they will just exclude you from certain activities. And, and a lot of times they make it seem like it's inadvertent. Bullies often use isolation as a tactic to exert control over their targets. If you notice yourself being deliberately left out of meetings, deliberately left out of decisions, deliberately left out of team gatherings. And a lot of times they make it seem like it's inadvertent. I thought I put you on that email chain. How come I thought you were on that? I thought you were on that text chain. I thought you were on that message. It's crucial to pay attention to this kind of pattern. Being excluded from ex essential meetings, essential workplace gatherings can be emotionally draining. It messes with your head. You know, it, it really can negatively impact your sense of well being, your sense of belonging, and it, it makes you feel paranoid, frankly. If your team 
for example, is organizing a brainstorming session and you're consistently being left out and you're missing valuable opportunities to being you know, able to contribute your ideas and your expertise. And, and, you know, you know that it took place already. It really messes with you. It really can mess with your head. Or you notice that your colleagues regularly gather for after work drinks or or coffee. Oh, you, you heard about it the next day. You heard about it the next week. Oh, everybody got together. I didn't get to be involved with that. It's so not fun to be part of that. You know, it makes you feel isolated. It makes you feel alone. It makes you feel disconnected. Number three is work sabotage. Workplace bullies often resort to tactics aimed at hindering your ability to perform your job effectively. So this could involve withholding crucial information, setting unreasonable deadlines, or overwhelming you with an unmanageable workload. Such These types of actions are intended to create stress and frustration and underwhelm your professional reputation. So for example, a coworker fails to share vital information with you regarding a project, causing delays and making it appear like you're not capable of handling your responsibilities. Another one is your supervisor consistently assigns you with urgent tasks, with tight deadlines, making it appear like you're not capable of handling things, right? There's no way that you would be able to complete them on time. And so you're like constantly under the stress or anxiety. That's just so not fair in those situations. I mean, if you guys have seen any of this, I want you to put totally in the comments because I would love to know what you've seen or, or not seen so far. And, and just give me some feedback on this, you know, which, which ones of you guys have seen of these so far. And if you're trying to negotiate with anybody in a, a situation like this, make sure you grab my free negotiation book, which is a free ebook in which you can get at winmynegotiation.com. The number four sign that you're being targeted in a workplace is verbal or physical abuse. Yes, physical abuse can happen. Certainly that's not fun when you're the target of blatant aggression, but it can happen yelling. I've certainly seen that before. Threatening of violence or actual acts of violence. Derogatory language can be happening. Subtle acts of violence, teasing, passive aggression, passive aggressive remarks, such as, you know, I've actually seen people say things like, this is the worst piece of crap I've ever seen, you know, referring to work product. You know, it's awful. It can make you feel embarrassed. It can make you feel humiliated. It can make you feel disrespected. By the way, if you need additional support, I have a free private Facebook group, which you can join. It's Narcissist Negotiators with Rebecca Zung. If you need therapy and you don't have access to therapy, we have a sponsor on this channel. It's BetterHelp. You can go to betterhelp.com forward slash Rebecca Zung to access that. It is a sponsor for us. So we receive commissions on that. It doesn't cost you any extra. We just want you to have access to help and support that you can trust. So number five is spreading rumors or gossip. That is horrible when, when that happens. You know, a smear campaign, especially when people are saying things that are just blatantly not true, spreading things about you like that you're not good at your job or that you're, you know, maybe slutty or you're, you're a drinker or that you're on drugs or something like that. Spreading false rumors or malicious gossip about you can be a form of emotional manipulation. It can have severe consequences about you and, you know, about your personal life or your professional life. So, you know, examples of that can be, that, you know, that you're seeking a promotion with unethical means. It can damage your credibility. It can hinder your chances of advancing your career. It's very, very damaging. Another one could be spreading false details about your, per your personal life, leading others to view you differently and causing unnecessary stress or humiliation. They can be saying that, you know, you cheat on your spouse or whatever it is. I do have a video on how to uh, shut down a narcissist smear campaign. I highly recommend that you 
check that out if you need to. Number six is unreasonable work expectations. This is so stressful sometimes. If you find yourself suddenly burdened with an overwhelming workload or unreasonable deadlines. It might be a tactic to set you up for failure, especially if you have a bullying boss, right? Being constantly overwhelmed can lead to burnout. It can lead to negatively affecting your mental or physical health. Your supervisor, for example, can assign you multiple projects with very tight deadlines, making it impossible for you to produce high quality work within the given time frame. Another example might be a manager increasing your workload significantly without providing additional resources or support, leaving you feeling overwhelmed and unable to meet the increase in demands. All right. So that's number six. Number seven, this is a big time one, especially with covert narcissists, but definitely grandiose as well. And that is not giving you credit for your work or taking credit for your work, right? So not receiving you due credit, your accomplishments may be overlooked and downplayed or even claimed by the bully, leaving you feeling undervalued, underappreciated. And this behavior is aimed at diminishing your confidence and sense of achievement. So for example, you contribute extensively to a, a successful project, but your coworker takes all the credit during the presentation. So not fun. The next one is your supervisor presents an, your innovative solution as, you know, their own idea and your efforts or hard work are completely disregarded. The last one, number eight, is, you know, feeling stressed, anxious, depressed. This is where workplace bullying really takes a toll on your emotional well-being. It leads to symptoms of stress, anxiety, even depression. And it's essential to recognize that these emotional responses take additional steps to start addressing the root cause. Right. So this is where you start to really dread going to work. You know, if you start to notice this and you know that you really start looking at what's going on there, you're going to have to start facing that constant belittlement that what's happening and realizing that this is something that is real. If you're knowing that that constant belittlement, the negativity, from the, your coworkers or your supervisors happening, you know that that workplace bullying is something that's real. If you find yourself constantly anxious about the interactions with certain colleagues or fearing their criticism or hurtful con comments, it's, it's time to do something about it. All right. So remember, if you're experiencing even one or two of these signs on a, a you know, on a, on a regular basis, it may, may not automatically mean that you're a victim of workplace bullying, but it, it means that there's definitely red flags there that you want to take a look at. But if you're definitely experiencing multiples of these, it, it's crucial that you start to take action and you have the power to create positive change in your life. You have the power to make a decision to make a difference. Remember, step one is don't run. Step two, make a U-turn. Step three, break free. So you can make a change. You can make a difference. You have the power to do this. All right. So in today's video, we are going to dive into how to bully proof your career by giving you 10 empowering strategies to crush workplace bullying. The first thing that you can do is recognize the signs, recognize the signs that you are actually being bullied. You know, I was actually bullied as a kid and I didn't even know that I was 
being bullied again by this person. I just knew that it didn't feel good being in relationship with this person. Sometimes because it's so covert, it's like death by a thousand cut. You're inadvertently being left off an email. They're just inadvertently forgetting little things about you or being passive aggressive, like saying that they're going to do something and not doing it. It just often starts very, very, very subtly And it becomes soul crushing. It's crucial to be aware that this is a form of bullying. It is a form of psychological abuse. It's psychological warfare. Those little changes in behavior, changes in behavior in the person, and then changes in, in behavior of the people who the person is talking to and the people around you can be a sign that something is going on, a sign that there is bullying happening. If you find yourself feeling targeted and demeaned, it's crucial to acknowledge the situation and address it head on because it will empower you and it will empower you that you are taking action about it. If your supervisor is persistently dismissing your contributions, making you feel insignificant, identify this as bullying and it will enable you to confront this situation and seek out the support that you need to seek out. By the way, I do have a support group. It's Narcissist Negotiators with Rebecca Zung. Please feel free to join that. It's on Facebook. There are a lot of people in there supporting each other. I encourage you to join it. It will definitely help you as well. And by the way, if you need access to therapy and you don't have access to therapy, I also have a sponsor on this channel. It is BetterHelp. You can go to betterhelp.com forward slash Rebecca Zung. It is a sponsor for us, which means we receive commissions on it. You don't pay any extra. I also want you to have access to help and support that you need that you can trust. The next one is maintain emotional resilience. Developing emotional resilience is essential in overcoming workplace bullying. Remember, you cannot control other people's actions know that it's not, doesn't have anything to do with you. These are people who have low self-esteem to begin with, but you know, you can control your reaction to it, cultivating emotional intelligence about it, practicing that self-care, seeking support, seeking support from friends, family, getting that professional help that you need that we just talked about mentally staying strong, that will help you. If you are facing that constant criticism, learning to focus on knowing what's true, knowing your truth, staying positive, viewing it as an opportunity for you to grow and considering that source rather than taking it personally will definitely help you maintain that emotional resilience, rise above that will help you as well. The next thing that you can do is set boundaries. Establishing clear boundaries is a way to protect yourself in the workplace. Have polite but firm communication and set limits. Let others know when their behavior is crossing the line. It's okay for you to to say, this is not okay for me. Let them know that you're not tolerating disrespectful behavior. Don't allow anyone to disrespect you. These are the things that are negotiable, contracts, issues, terms. The things that are not negotiable are your self-respect, your self-esteem, who you are. The next one is number four, which is document incidents. Write things down, keep a record of any bullying incidents that you experience or that you witness. Detailed documentation will help you present a clear case if you need to report the bullying to human resources or to management. Making sure that you have a comprehensive log of events will always strengthen your position and ensure that your concerns are taken seriously. I have won entire cases on people's documentation. So especially if it is done simultaneously with the incident happening, if a colleague publicly humiliates you during a meeting, jot down something specific that was made at that time, make sure you do it without 
bad language, make sure you do it without the emotion involved, just factual. The next thing is you want to seek support from other coworkers. If you are seeing other people go through the same thing, make sure that others are doing the same thing. Seek support at work as well. So in addition to seeking support through your own personal network, see if there are allies that you have within your workplace, trusted colleagues, trusted supervisors, because that will definitely help you as well. The next thing that you could potentially do is actually confront the person who is doing the bullying. I have actually done this before when it was a an opposing counsel, when it was my business partner, whoever it is. You don't need to do this in a confrontational setting, just specifically say, Hey, can we discuss this? What specifically is your issue in a way that is assertive one-on-one -on -one communication can address the issue. And instead of being critical, maybe there's a way that you can resolve it with them. The next thing that you can do is utilize company resources. If there are any human resources, if there's a support system, if there's a policy in place, maybe there's even some sort of an anonymous way that some sort of investigation can be done or some sort of an anonymous reporting system to ensure that your concerns are heard. If there is, then take advantage of that. If you guys have seen any of this or tried any of this, let me know in the comments and let me know what you have found helpful so far. The next one is focusing on your own personal growth. You know that they're not going to change. You know, you have to change you. No one's going to knock on, on your door and, and say, hey, I'm going to take care of them for you. I'm going to go beat, beat them up for you or whatever. You have to come and work on you. By you showing up and standing in your power, it will actually transform them. In a lot of ways, you tell people how to treat you. I love the saying that if you don't want to be a doormat, get up off the floor. It is so interesting when you start showing up differently, people start treating you differently as well. Start reading things on personal growth, start attending workshops on conflict resolution, start building your ability to address these situations differently, enroll in courses, you know, watch these videos, that sort of thing. It will help you. The next thing is to stay true to your values, stay true to who you are, start visualizing who it is that you want to be and start being that person. I have very often started saying things like, I am confident, I am strong. Just really authentically know who you are. Just knowing that authentic power always beats counterfeit power every single time. And if someone pressures you, to start getting into that mud with them. You don't go there. Don't compromise your own integrity. Standing firm in that, that will help you tremendously as well. Finally, certainly always know when to consider external opportunities also. I wouldn't say always go ahead and run. I wouldn't think of it as running away from as walking toward. Walking toward other opportunities, it's really important to say, I'm not making my current situation wrong. I'm creating something new that's right for me. If you think of it in terms of that, it will make things so much better for you. Being in gratitude about your current situation will ensure that you don't repeat the same patterns or the same energy. You must learn the lessons of where you are now in order to make sure that they don't get repeated. You hold the power to shape your destiny. You hold the power to make sure that you stay empowered and you become bully proof. People see vulnerabilities in people. And I want to make sure that you inspire, you inspire yourself, you inspire positive change in yourself, and you become that change in yourself. Use this as an opportunity for growth for yourself. That's the most important thing. And not make it about the bullies, not make it about the bullies, but make it about yourself. Make it about an opportunity opportunity for yourself for empowerment, make it about yourself for growth. And then down the road, you know, when you see other people in these situations,
situations, you can turn around and you can be that helping hand. You can be the one that says, Hey, I've been where you are. I can help you. I can coach you through this. Okay. So maybe you are dealing with a toxic boss. Maybe it's a toxic colleague or whatever, but in this video, I really want to tackle those signs of a narcissistic boss because this is really one of the most horrible situations when you feel like you got to get up in the morning, you got to go in and you just don't want to. I mean, you spend more time at work than probably anywhere else in your life. A lot of times we're sleeping, you know, we go home at night, we spend a couple of hours before we have to go to bed and then we got to get up and we got to do it all over again. If you're not happy at work because you have to deal with this person, it, it can really make your life miserable. So I want to go over the signs of narcissism at work, the signs of a narcissistic boss so that you can spot this and, and then maybe start to figure out how you're going to start putting some boundaries in place and maybe even start to create a plan for figure out if you're going to even stay in this particular situation or maybe figure out if you're going to move on and find a different situation. All right. So obviously, you know that the DSM-5 is what they use to determine whether or not a person is a narcissist at all. And one of the signs of narcissism is a need to be the center of attention. And so if this person needs to be the center of attention, not just, you know, I like to get attention, you know, everybody wants to know that they matter. That doesn't make the person a narcissist. Everybody wants to know that they matter. They want to be acknowledged. That, that just makes a person a human, right? I mean, I'm sure you like that too. I know I like to be acknowledged. Of course, we all want to know that we matter. That's not being a narcissist. We're talking about they need to be the center of attention to the detriment of others. Not only do they need to be the center of attention, but they do this in a way that actually is hurtful to others a lot of times. And they regularly put themselves down, I mean, put other people down in order to make themselves look better. They manipulate situations to be the center of attention and make sure that they are the center of attention. I know that, you know, when I've had narcissistic bosses, which is why I haven't had a boss in a long time because I've owned my own company for a long time. But, you know, when I was in situations when I had bosses before and it was, you know, where they were taking credit for my work or other people's work in the company, you know, that sort of thing, or, you know, because they had to be the center of attention, I would write articles with people and they refused to put, you know, my name on it, it you know, it, and it wasn't just me, it was, you know, other people in the company or, you know, you, you do good things for the company and they don't want to acknowledge that, you know, or they play favorites with people in the company, they pit people against each other in the company, you know, that sort of thing. They talk bad about other people in the company. When you start to see situations like that, it is just not a good situation. They may even talk down to you. They talk badly to you. I've seen bosses where they actually are verbally abusive to employees. You know, I've actually seen bosses say things to employees like, this is the worst piece of S this uh, I've ever seen, where it, it actually is like blatant like that. Or, you know, or it could be more passive aggressive than that. You know, like, is this 
something that you just made up? Or is this something that you actually did? Or they actually feeling like the employee is a rival of them, you know, where they're, a, they're, they're actually afraid that the employee might somehow look better than them in some way. They're concerned about that. So maybe they, they just don't want the employee to shine more than they do. You know, that sometimes is a concern. They often lack empathy for the employee, which can be a problem. You know, like I actually was in a situation one time where the the boss had such lack of empathy for the employees. And, and this particular boss was a single mom herself at one point, but then her by the time we got there, her kids had been grown, but one of the other employees was a single mom. She actually, you know, told the single mom that, you know, her kids should take an Uber or a cab to take themselves to doctor's appointments that, you know, she wasn't allowed to take time off. Like she didn't really care that, you know, her kids needed if they were sick or anything like that, there was absolutely no empathy for that, completely insensitive to what was going on for this particular single mom. You know, the bosses who are, you know, if somebody's dog died or something, they might just be like, so what? Who cares? If, if there's a death in the family or something, they might just be like, you know, that we have to work. People can't just take time off. You know, I've seen that before. You know, they they um, maybe they over exaggerate themselves, their accomplishments, their abilities. They actually might lie about themselves and their abilities. You might actually see them lie about their accomplishments and their abilities to clients. And you know that what they're saying is not true. That I've seen before as well, you know, which is completely wrong. You you might actually see them lie about numbers of what the company is doing, you know, as far as how successful the co company actually is. You might see that they don't have integrity around that. You might actually see them cheating clients as far as cheating them out of money. That's something else that you might see a narcissistic boss doing. You might see them, you know, taking advantage of people, taking advantage, not just of, of clients, but taking advantage of, of other employees in the company as well, you know, to get what they want, lying, lying to clients, lying to other people, lying to their spouses, you know, you might see them telling their spouse that they're at work and you know that they haven't been at work. You might see them being with other people that they're, you know, that there's cheating on their spouse and you might have to, they might ask you to cover for them, which you might feel uncomfortable about. You know, all of these things are just not okay. And if you agree with me, just put not okay in the comments, right? So, and you might see that the boss is just constantly bragging about his or her accomplishments, bragging about how great they are, bragging about all the things that they've done in the past and getting you to constantly acknowledge how great they are, making sure that you know all of the amazing things that they've done, how smart they are, how brilliant they are. Also, if they make mistakes, if they've, you know, if they screw up, they blame you or they blame others. They don't ever take responsibility for that. That's a really uncomfortable situation to be in. You see them that they never say sorry. They never apologize, especially if they make you take responsibility for that. And they're blaming you and they're angry at you and they, you know, they're yelling at you and you know that it's not you, you know that it was them, but yet they're yelling at you for it. And they, they can even be verbally and emotionally abusive 
toward you. And you know that it was their screw up, you know, and that that often happens. So th- those are just some of the things that I have seen with narcissistic bosses, making them make, making people st- work ridiculous hours, making people stay late, demeaning people, making people who are have very amazing skills, getting them coffee just to treat them poorly, just because they can, just to show them that they have control over them, just to demean them on purpose, just to degrade them on purpose, just to personally show them that they can publicly humiliate them on purpose, triangulate people, get somebody to be angry at somebody else because they want this person to be pitted against this person. They want to make sure that these two people never become friends because they don't want these two people to ever be friends with each other. They want them both to be beholden to them and them alone. You know, so those are just some of the things. If you've seen any of these things, I'm sure that you are probably dealing with a narcissistic boss and it's probably a highly toxic work environment and probably not one in which you want to stay very long. And and one thing that I do want you to know is that I've been in situations like that and it's not something that you can tolerate, but there are things that you can do in the short term, which is, you know, you can say, I will not be disrespected as a human being. And you cannot speak to me in a way that's disrespectful, you know, and, and yes, I work for you, but I will be treated in a way that's respectful. And, and if they don't want to treat you in a way that's respectful, you don't have to stay there. You know, you, there are other situations out there And you just need to start thinking about how you're going to manifest that. Just start writing out what your perfect job is going to be for you. Start deciding that you're manifesting that and start thinking about where it is that you want to be and what that's going to look like for you and start deciding where it is that you want to go. But then there's something that happened. I want to get to the narcissist in your life. (laughs) <laughs> the sneaky narcissist. Yeah. As I kept getting promoted and, and the CEO I worked for was a male, the president of the company was a male. However, the only other peer um, from the executive level that was a female was our CFO. And along the way, the higher I would rise, the less and less she would like me. Right at first it was, oh, great. Happy to have you here as you know, I entered into the executive team. But then I got promoted to executive vice president. Then I got promoted to chief revenue officer. And she and I were at the exact same level. And during that time, I thought to myself, I'm making her a little uncomfortable. I could sense that there was something that she liked less and less about me. And so I started somewhat turning a blind eye to her bad behavior, passive aggressive, not responding to emails, not including me in meetings I should be included in. And instead of really owning my voice and- Oh, and by the way, that is so, that is so covert narcissist behavior. Passive aggressiveness is total covert narcissist behavior. And then when you call them out on, uh, you know, not including you on meetings, it's like, oh, I thought that I had included you, you know, and it's like that plausible deniability. Oh, I didn't include you on that. Oh, I thought I did, you know, that sort of thing. Um, you know, where, where, you know, oh, and, and everybody else thinks that they're super nice. So you, you know, that they at least, the ones that I had dealt with. Oh yeah, because this person definitely treated me differently than she treated other people. I mean, she would enter into a meeting and and almost hug people and welcome them. And when I would walk in, she wouldn't even say hello or acknowledge my presence. And, you know, over time I started noticing it was chipping away at my confidence. I was becoming more of a B-rate version of myself because I felt so uncomfortable entering into these situations, even just a, a basic meeting. I always felt, you know, as the odd man out. However, I had really allowed that to happen by turning a blind eye to her behavior, not acknowledging it. And finally, one day I woke up and I just said, I've had enough of this, you know, in my own mind. I, 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 I want to just, I want to stop. I want to stop you there because that is so, so important. You're like 
you're, you're saying stuff that's so, so important that I want to like mention because they condition you. And, and what you're saying is something that I want to make sure that I highlight for people that they understand. It's that conditioning, because when you're a person who is an, an empathic person, a good person, a nice person, a normal person, a normal person, it's like you're not sure if you should say something, you're not sure if you should bring it up. And it's like, is it is it something that you should like call out? You know, is it something big enough that you should say, you know, you don't want to make waves so you don't end up, you know, calling it out. And then you end up kind of almost being conditioned and um, that person, oh, look, I got away with it. I got away with this. I got away with that. Mm -hmm. And then it happens again and again, like over time, and you end up sort of being conditioned. Um, you know, I, I, I got away with not, um, inviting her to this meeting. I got away with, um, not including her on that email. I got away with this. And then, you know, over time it was several things that happened, but you were conditioned over time. And that's what they end up doing is this conditioning, um, where you were, um, allowing this to happen but not like intentionally allowing it to happen. I mean, and that's what I want people to understand. It's like, you know, people feel bad about themselves or they feel like, you know, oh, how did I let this happen? How did it, ha you know, but it's like, because it's like these little things, it's like death by a thousand cuts, you know, it, it's like, do I, do I say something about that little thing? Oh, I wasn't included on this email. That seems so stupid, like to bring that up, you know, it's like, but then it's these little things over time. And so I just want to make sure that I highlight this because this is so typical, especially of a covert narcissist. And you know, it's interesting to that point, and thank you for highlighting that, is that I would also reach out to people around her to say, am I crazy? I would go to her brother who I had a better relationship with and say, am I crazy? I feel like she just keeps cutting me out. What's going on? Because I was looking for some validation or clarity. I truly felt so confused. I didn't want to think the worst, especially earlier on. The longer it went on, the more clear it became to me. But I would go to her brother and he would say, oh, you know her. She's 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 being annoying. She's probably jealous. Don't worry. You know, women. He would say that too. So, you know, women can't put two uh, women yes. together. And that's what they do. And they just sort of poo poo it. And, and, and you think you're going crazy. And by the way, they end up, they're like watching you. They're just observing you all the time. They're watching you, watching you, watching you. And you, they almost like want to become you. They almost like mm -hmm. want to like, they have this like fixation and this obsession over you because they're so like, um, in, in some ways there's an admiration of you at the same time as at the same time that they're super jealous of you. That's the, you know, what is my experience of it as well. Oh, it's so true. And you know, it's funny. I look back earlier in my career, when I first came to the company, this woman was such an introvert, the typical CFO you would think of, you know, literally with a calculator running around, not speaking to anyone. I'm very much an extrovert leading a sales organization. So I'm forward facing. My job is to communicate and, and, and make people feel comfortable and create relationships. So we were complete opposites. However, during my tenure and as I would advance, I started noticing, wow, she's starting to give speeches at meetings. That's weird. She's dressing differently. That's weird. I didn't notice it until one day. I will never forget. She was winning some award. I was at the event and, and I thought to myself, wow, I'm in awe of this woman. She is nothing. She doesn't look like, act like, speak like, dress like the person I met here 10 years ago. So I went up to her to ask. I said, listen, I've got to ask you a question. You've literally, like a flower, I've seen you when you were closed when I got here, open up and bloom before my very eyes. As another woman in business, and I was a little bit younger than her, I said, could you give me some advice? How can I follow along your path and try to learn in, in my way how I could you know, ex expand myself? And she looked at me and said, I have no idea what you're talking about. And I remember that cocktail party. And then she said, but if I come up with any idea that something hits me, I'll let you know in the future. And I said, okay. And I remember leaving, feeling bad about myself that evening and thinking, Heather, here you are thinking she did some special thing. She was just being herself, which left me feeling like I'm, I don't have that in within me. However, fast forward a couple of years, 
I was a lot smarter. I was more exposed to the world and I had friends who were running at a much higher level and they started telling me, I hired a publicist, Heather. I heard, hired a personal shopper. I hired a stylist. I hired a speaking coach. I hired an executive coach. My friends started telling me everything that this woman had been doing right before me, but she, instead of like my friends telling me they're doing it, she was trying to keep it a secret and make me think that I'm crazy. Yeah. So she didn't want you to have the secret sauce, of course. Right. Yeah. She's not going to tell you because she doesn't want you to be better. But then it's, just, what it, it's so it, it, obvious now. <laughs> yeah. But then what did she end up doing? Well, I ended up um, in, you know, she was my peer. So there really wasn't anything she could do to me for a long time. Her father became ill and she became interim CEO, which means you're somewhat have the title, but you don't have all the power. She would still have to defer to the ultimate CEO chairman for approval on certain things. So she made my life a living hell, basically, in the next year. I launched a personal brand, um, forward-facing. You know, I, I made all of my profiles public in an effort to try to attract talent to the company. I was always trying to recruit new and better people. That made my life easier. And so this was a strategy I implemented, which was brilliant at the time. You know, no one was doing it in my industry. I was attracting so much talent to the company. But at the same time, I was turning my light up, right? I was getting noticed. I started winning more awards. I started getting asked to speak at, on bigger stages and she hated that. And so she had the GC contact me, threatening me that you can't have a personal brand. It's a conflict of interest, read your contract. And I had already done my due diligence. I had hired an attorney. I knew that I had every right to do this and I would put whatever verbiage they wanted on. You know, I would address, it was just so ridiculous that I was every day, you know, being basically attacked for doing nothing wrong. So in the end, she ended up getting the ultimate title CEO when her father became ill enough. And when that happened, she fired me immediately. Fired you like, boom, like that. You had made so much money for the company and did all this stuff and yeah, just fired you. And then yeah, so she, how- um, she said there was no, no need for my position any longer. So the company no longer needed me. Yeah. And then, so how did you feel? Like, tell us about that. You went home and what? Well, it was a horrible situation, but I was so sick of being bullied by this woman that on our last meeting where she actually did terminate me, I pulled the rug out from underneath her. I was so sick of being bullied in her really passive aggressive way that she tried to pressure me in the meeting to sign a non-disparaging agreement to protect herself and protect her company to ensure I never shared any of the things that I share now publicly. And I refused <laughs> it. I said, I said, I'm not interested in, and you know, you standing there trying to hold a paycheck over me doesn't work anymore. And to see her face change physically, the color, the complete dynamic in the room was changed instantaneously when I declined her offer and stood up with a lot of class and walked out without getting angry, without getting mad. Of course, I got to my car and I was bawling my eyes out because I didn't know how I was going to pay my bills. But in that moment, I took back all the confidence that I had lost over those years. And I felt so proud of myself. Yeah. And I want to point out to everybody, you just like sucked her leverage away, like because she wanted that, like she wanted to see you squirm. She wanted to see, you know, that to hold that uh, uh, power over you and you just suck that away from her. And I love the fact that you didn't show that like emotion in front of her, which is something that I tell people all the time, like, you know, get to your car, scream, cry, whatever in your pillow at home and your shower, whatever. But in that moment, you know, you were like, don't give them that power in that moment. Right. So you get home and I, I, you know, I heard you say like, you were like under a weighted blanket for like, whatever, you know, like you felt like uh, the world had come to an end, but it turned out to be the best thing that ever happened to you. So talk about that. It did. The first thing, once I came to and, and came out from the weighted blanket and crying was I decided no one knows I'm fired. She was keeping it a secret, right? And so I thought, you know what? I'm going to go promote that I've been fired, which a lot of people thought was crazy, told me not to do it. I checked in with the one voice that counts, your own. And to me, I said, for me, this is the right thing. I'm going to reframe getting fired. And I Googled who is successful that's been fired. 
Turns out J.K. Rowling, Oprah, Mark Cuban, Steve Jobs, the list goes on and on. I decided to see it as in good company, right? This is the level you want to roll at. You need to get fired. So I posted, I've just been fired. It's a really challenging situation. If I've ever helped you, I need to hear from you now. And I asked for help. And that post went viral, landed me on the Elvis Duran show. And halfway through that interview, he said to me, obviously, you're writing a book, Heather. But I wasn't, you know, I hadn't thought anything out yet. And so him believing in me and transferring that confidence in me led me to Google, how do you write a book? And all I have to do is sit down and write. And I knew I could do that. So uh, five months later, I launched Confidence Creator, which went, it went number one on the Amazon business biography list. And at the time, Donald Trump was president and it moved his book to number two. Um, so I Trump Trump for number one on the business biography list the awesome. first week my book came out. So awesome, which is what we're going to be talking about today is dealing with toxic coworkers, colleagues, clients, whoever it is that you're dealing with in a day-to-day basis, they can make your life freaking miserable. So here's the first strategy. The first strategy is maintaining boundaries. I always say step one, don't run. Step two, make a U-turn. Step three, break. Free. So the first thing that you have to do, have to do, have to do, have to do is maintain boundaries. So clear boundaries when you are dealing with somebody toxic is so, so, so important. Whether it's a boss or a colleague or a subordinate, whoever it is, toxic behavior can be so contagious. And you always have the right to say you have, you have to speak to me in a respectful manner. No matter who it is, you have the right to say that. And if we don't set limits, it might affect our own well-being. You dictate how people treat you by how you carry yourself, how you show up for yourself. You know, there's an old saying, like, if you don't want to be a doormat, get off the floor. So limit unnecessary interactions and avoid engaging in, you know, situations that are going to be putting yourself in places where you you can't have boundaries, right? Don't engage in gossip. Don't engage in negative conversations. Stay professional. When you engage in situations where you're not going to be able to have boundaries, it puts you in situations that heightens the chance that you're not going to be able to have those boundaries in place. Stay professional, stay focused on your work, and it sends a powerful message that you're not one that tolerates toxic behavior. Setting boundaries means that you know when to step away from toxic conversations. Don't allow yourself to be dragged into toxic conversations or situations where you're not going to be a person who just sets the example for other people in the workplace or other people that you work with. That's number one for setting boundaries. The next one is seeking support from others. Dealing with toxic coworkers can feel very, very isolating. But remember, you're not alone in this Seek support from people that you trust. If there's somebody else in that environment, within the workplace that you work with that you can trust, that's great. Just stick with them. Sharing your experience can be therapeutic. Remember, like attracts like. The more that you can surround yourself with people that are positive the better it can be. You are the product of the top five people that you spend the most time with. Spend more time with those people, all right? You know, defend your light with your life. They can maybe offer valuable insight on how to cope with those challenges as well. Confiding in them can maybe help you also. Not getting into gossip, not saying, hey, you know, this person is that way. But saying, hey, how can I stay strong? How can I stay positive? How can I be the example? You know, how can you be lifted up in these situations? Looking at how you can be higher, the better person, 
wearing that white hat. And if you can't find support within your organization, then maybe you have to stay out of that organization and find support elsewhere. And, you know, maybe that's not the organization for you. And maybe eventually you need to find a different organization or reevaluate where it is that you are always looking toward defending your light with your life, being that better person, not allowing yourself to succumb to being dragged down into the mud. If you need additional support or help, we do have a sponsor on this channel, which is BetterHelp. You can go to betterhelp.com forward slash Rebecca Zung to get therapy if that's what you need. It is a sponsor on this channel, which means that we receive commissions. It doesn't cost you any extra. We just want you to have the help and support that you need. I also have phrases for disarming narcissists, which you can grab at disarmthenarc.com if that is something that you need. Highly recommend that you get those. You can use them for emails or text messages, that sort of thing. We also have a private Facebook group that you can join, which is Narcissist Negotiators with Rebecca Zung. And I recommend that you get that or join that as well. Just be careful about who you open yourself up to. If you're trusting people, make sure that there's somebody that you can trust. Otherwise, you might want to look into using other resources like self-help books or audio books and things like that. The next one is communicating assertively, communicating assertively. When you stand in your power, it really makes a huge difference. People will think what you tell them to think. You know, when I was a lawyer for a while and then I went into being a financial planner for a while. And then I went back to being a lawyer and I was just starting my practice. And I was so nervous that the people in the community that I lived in were going to think that I was such a flake. And the business coach that I was working with at the time said, people will think what you tell them to think. And she said, you know, you can tell them to think that you are a flake, or you can tell them to think that you're the only lawyer who has a financial background. So therefore you are actually more qualified than any other lawyer in town because you actually have a financial background. Which story would you like to tell? And I remember thinking, oh, maybe I'll tell that story, which is exactly what I did. And I embraced my background instead. And within a couple of years, I actually had the top family law practice in the area representing billionaires and celebrities and all kinds of people who very clearly were not going to be hiring a flake. People will think what you tell them to think. I, I came in, I stood in my power, and that's what you also need to do. Communicate assertively, stand in your power. That makes a huge difference in how people will see you as well. When you find yourself in unavoidable interactions with toxic people, toxic coworkers, assertive communication is the key. Express your boundaries clearly. Let them know who you are. Don't be confrontational. You can say, I value our working relationship, but I need a more positive environment to thrive. This is not working for me. You can use I statements rather than you statements. You know, you statements tend to feel like you're blaming somebody. You can say, you know, this is not working for me. Your approach is not working for me, you know, so that the person doesn't feel attacked, making them maybe perhaps more receptive to change. That helps to disarm narcissists. I have a whole video on words that narcissists hate, you might want to check that out because maybe refrain from using those words. The next one is um, document incidents. Make sure that you're always documenting things that are happening because having evidence is going to be vital when you're dealing with toxicity at work and keeping records of incidents or you know anything that you witness because down the road, if you have to have a conversation with a superior or something that happens, dates, times, specific details will definitely help you. Documentation is always a powerful resource when you need to escalate incidents to 
maybe human resources or higher management. Every time you, you encounter toxic behavior, record it, use a dedicated journal with timestamps. It, it can be very, very invaluable when you go to present this information to the powers that be. You want to have concrete examples of what you've been dealing with, because then if you can create summaries, once again, the volume of that can be extremely powerful and persuasive down the road. When people are looking at repeated incidents and they see that it's not just an isolated incident, it can be very, very powerful. When, when people can see an email trail of interactions, it can be powerful to see that you've been the good one, you've worn the good hat, you've worn the, you've worn the white hat, and that you've been respectful, that you've been the one who tried. It helps a lot. If you understand this and you get this and it makes sense to you, give me a makes sense in the comments, something that you can do, put that in the comments, makes sense to me, I can do this, put that in the comments below. So, and then point five is focus on personal well-being. So important to self-care, take care of yourself. Your well-being, of course, should always be a priority for yourself when you're dealing with a toxic person. Toxic coworkers can definitely be emotionally draining. It can be extremely traumatic. So make sure you engage in something that can, you know, where you can take care of yourself outside of work, take care of your physical well-being, your mental well-being, your emotional well-being, your even your spiritual well-being so that you feel refreshed, energized, renewed, restored, breathing exercises, something that's going to help you pivot your mind, take care of your mind, whether it's meditation, yoga, gratitude journals, being with people who are going to lift you, whatever it is that is going to help you so that you can stay strong is so, so, so important. Mindfulness exercises. You want to stay grounded. You want to stay focused. You want to be able to observe your emotions almost like a third party so that you aren't triggered because if your emotions take over, then you will be finding yourself in a place that you perhaps don't want to be at work. Those are the five ways to overcome toxic coworkers.